He's the King of the Jews. That's why the world hates Him. He's the King of Israel. He's the King of righteousness. He's the King of the ages. He's King of heaven. He's King of glory. He's King of kings. He's Lord of lords. Any king you've got, He's King of that king. That's why this world don't like it. The heavens declare His glory. The firmament showeth His handiwork. No means of measure can define His limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of His shoreless supply. No barriers can hinder Him from pouring out His blessing. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. He's God's Son. Amen. He's the sinner's Savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. That's why the world don't like Him. They're jealous of Him. Because He's the highest of the high. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the supreme subject of higher criticism. He's the cardinal necessity of true religion. He's the miracle of the ages. He's everything good you can choose to call Him. He just can supply all our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted. Lord, in mercy, I can just go on and on and on. He's the one that's brought me through my problems. He's the one that's there when I wake up in the morning. And He's there with me when I go to bed at night. He helps me. He guides me. He feeds me. And every dime I've ever got, He gave it to me. He gave us this church. He's watched over us for 14 years. Hallelujah this morning. He's alive and well, people. And we've got the God that this world hates. Listen, if, if the world likes your religion, you got a false religion. If the world likes you, you're a false person. Amen? He said, me hateth, and they hated me before they hated you. Too many Christians today want to try to bring God down and make Him hip and cool so the world accepts Him. Never happened, brother. He don't come down to our level. we got to go up to Him. John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Lord Jesus Christ, as a member of the Godhead, had no beginning. He's always been here. John 8:58 says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Colossians 1:16 says, for by Him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. Revelation 4.11 says they were created for His pleasure. Since we are finite, we can't understand how Jesus Christ has always been here. Even in Genesis, the Bible lets us know about His part in creation. You might have overlooked it if you didn't pay attention, but in Genesis 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Notice verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1 says, And God said, and that would be the word. Jesus Christ is the living Word. John 1.1 1, 1 said, In the beginning was the Word. He was here at creation and here before creation. Jesus Christ made the world so the world revolves around Jesus Christ. His name has been made a cuss word. And for this reason you hear His name in almost every movie. And you hear His name in almost every song. People sing about Him every day. And think about this, when it gets hard to pray, the mediator between you and God the Father is the Lord Jesus Christ, and He is the same God who slung the stars into space and put everything into existence. He telleth the number of the stars, and He also knows them all by their names. Many believe He was just a good teacher or only a prophet. 
He was those things, but above all, he is God. The skeptics will say, he died, so therefore he can't be God. But they forget he rose from the dead by his own power, and that proves he's God. If that, that isn't enough proof, God the Father calls Jesus God in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. And if God called Jesus Christ God, then aren't you a liar for saying that Jesus Christ isn't God? After all, Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. God said Jesus was God, so who are we to say he isn't God? But you say, well, you believe in three gods. No, I'm not a polytheist, which means I believe in more than one God. I believe in one God, but he's one and three and three and one. In Romans 1, 20 and Colossians 2, 9, the Bible talks about the Godhead which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is a tripart being, and He made us the same way. We have three parts, a body, a soul, and a spirit, and God has a body, Jesus Christ, a soul, God the Father, and a spirit, the Holy Ghost. So Jesus Christ said, He that hath seen me has seen the Father. And a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 says, Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Not only this, but the Bible makes it clear that Jesus Christ shares the same attributes that only God himself has. Jesus is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. In Matthew twenty-eight eighteen, he says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He is also omniscient. Revelation two twenty-three says he searches the reins and hearts. Even here on earth, when he was here, he knew the thoughts of the people. He knew the thoughts of the Pharisees. And he knows your thoughts that you're thinking at this moment. So he is all-knowing. Not only this, but he is omnipresent. He can be everywhere at once. Matthew 18.20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Even while Jesus Christ was physically here on earth, his Holy Spirit was present everywhere at once. These are only attributes that God has. Satan is very powerful, but he can only work under the limitations God has set. And he may know a lot of things, but he doesn't know everything. He can probably see much of what is going on at once, but he still isn't everywhere at once. Jesus Christ is easily, without question, the most amazing person in Scripture. He is God Almighty in the flesh. And any other false god is pale in comparison. If you're saved, then you have 24-7 access to talk to Jesus Christ anytime you want. And that's with all of his attention. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. There are people who would spend money to talk to their favorite athlete or movie star. But if you're saved, you can talk to the God who made the world. Jesus Christ has always been and always will be. You can see him in the Old Testament in pictures and types before anyone even heard the name Jesus Christ. Nebuchadnezzar knew God had a son. In Daniel 3.25, King Nebuchadnezzar knew the Son of God was with the Hebrew boys in the fire. In Proverbs 30 and verse 4 it says, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Or who hath gathered the winds in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. Not only this, but Jesus made many appearances in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. It's easy to believe if you realize the Bible is true and that the Bible says God cannot lie. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. So Jesus Christ was virgin born. He had to be. If he had an earthly father, then he would have had a sin nature. Isaiah 7.14 prophesied saying, A young woman shall conceive. No, that's not what it said. That's what the new version say it said. But if you have a King James Bible, it says a virgin shall conceive. You say that's impossible. But God also said, is anything too hard for God? Nothing is too hard for God. 
So Jesus was born of a virgin, and he is God manifest in the flesh. God knew that man couldn't get to heaven by his own righteousness, so the Son left heaven to manifest himself in the flesh, to live a sinless life, and die on the cross shedding his blood for our sins. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Maybe you can't explain how Jesus Christ came down to earth as a baby and had to be taken care of by his parents as a baby. His parents had to feed him, clothe him, burp him, change his diapers, and take care of him. That's a mystery, as the Bible calls it. It may be a bit hard to understand, but if you deny it, then you deny God. In Luke chapter 2, Mary and Joseph went looking for Jesus and found him in a temple talking to the doctors. And the doctors were amazed at his understanding and answers. And Mary said to Jesus, Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. But Jesus replies, How is it that you sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? Jesus quickly lets her know that Joseph isn't his father. But the Bible says, he increased in wisdom and stature. And soon John the Baptist comes along baptizing men, and his baptism was to manifest Jesus Christ to Israel. John the Baptist was a rough guy who ate locusts and wild honey. He wore a leather girdle. He was so rough that had the Jews accepted Jesus Christ, then John the Baptist would have been the second coming of Elijah, who was another one of the most roughest characters in the scriptures if john the baptist was so tough then i doubt he would have been impressed with the sissy jesus portrayed by hollywood jesus christ wasn't a sissy by any means like you see him portrayed in the movies jesus christ came to be baptized by john the baptist to fulfill all righteousness as it says in matthew 3:15. you know why water baptism isn't required for salvation because Jesus Christ was baptized. He did all the work for us. Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And that is when the devil showed up to tempt him. Jesus Christ at his weakest point. Didn't give in to the temptations of the devil. He never sinned once. And when the devil tempted him. He continued to quote scripture saying it is written. And Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted in all the same ways that we are tempted, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to lust and give in to the temptation. And Jesus Christ preached when he was here. He did not have any sermonettes. He did not preach like Joseph Prince or Joel Osteen or Paula White or any money-hungry TV preacher. Jesus said himself he didn't even have a place to lay his head. He is the one who started using the phrase hellfire. He was not cool and slick and acceptable to the world. He called people blind and fools. And in Matthew 23:33, he says, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Jesus was a rough talking preacher. In John 2 13 through 16, it says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen. And poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables. He said unto them that sold doves. Take these things hence. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Jesus Christ was not like these sissy preachers today. I imagine he looked pretty rough. He worked with his hands as a carpenter. Isaiah 50 and verse 6 says. I gave my back to the smiters. And my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So that shows Jesus Christ had a beard. He wasn't a clean cut guy. Leviticus 19.27 lets us know he had long hair and a beard. 
And a lot of these guys want to make you believe Jesus Christ had a baby face and a crew cut, but the Bible teaches otherwise. So Jesus was a rough looking character. Song of Solomon 5.11 says his locks are bushy and black as a raven. And if he took the beating and the torment of the cross and didn't give in, he had to be tough. He did many miracles while he was here, casting out devils, raising the dead, healing the lame and the blind. He fed the 5,000, turned the water into wine, walked on the water, put Malchus's ears back on his head, and the list goes on. He confirmed his word with signs because the Jews require a sign. People hated him when he was here. In John chapter 17, 18, Jesus said God was his father, making himself equal with God. The Jews saw this as blasphemy and wanted him dead. And in John 15, 18, it says, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. They hated him so much that they had him crucified. And Judas Iscariot, the traitor, sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. And Judas is a type of the Antichrist. He actually may come back as the Antichrist. He is the son of perdition, just like the Antichrist is called the son of perdition. The Bible doesn't say Judas went to hell. It says he went to his own place. And Judas betrayed Jesus Christ with a kiss. The Antichrist is called a leopard in the book of Revelation. And a leopard's spots looks kind of like the imprint of a kiss. Judas gets a head wound and the Antichrist gets a head wound. When Jesus Christ is crucified, he is crucified at the place of the skull. And they slam that cross into the place of the skull. And this is a picture of the devil getting his head crushed. But Jesus Christ endures the cross so that we can be saved and have eternal life. He died for the sins of all mankind. He died for the ones he knew who would reject him. And 1 John 2, 2 says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He didn't come down from the cross with the angels, even though he could have called down a legion of angels to save him. He could have saved himself without the angels. But he died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And this is the gospel for us today in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, but which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. We can't pay our way into heaven. We have to get there through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Acts 20:28 20, says he purchased us with his own blood. Revelation 1, 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 Peter 119 calls Jesus Christ's blood precious blood and said that it says that it's not like the corruptible things as silver and gold. Uh, Colossians 114 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 120 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Ephesians 1 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Romans 3.25 Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Romans 5.9 Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We don't need to preach a bloodless gospel. Jesus Christ's blood is what washes away our sins. So Jesus Christ died and shed his blood for us. We know he is God because he rose from the dead. And Romans 8.34 says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. 1 Corinthians 15.13 
But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. 1 Corinthians 15.20 But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. He was sent of the apostles for forty whole days after he resurrected. And right now he is sitting at the right hand of God and living in all born again believers. And spiritually we are sitting in heavenly places in Christ. Romans 8.10 says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Colossians 1.27 To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ is in me and I am in him. All born again believers make up the body of Christ. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus Christ is the mediator. We don't need a Catholic priest. To get to God, we have Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is my advocate when I sin. Since I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to my record, I'm going to go to heaven no matter what. I should still try my absolute best to live right and abstain from sinning. And if I do sin, Jesus is my advocate. 1 John 2 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ is coming back to get us in a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble because we are not appointed to wrath and we're going to get a glorified body just like his. 1 John 3 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Jesus Christ in his glorified body went to heaven and back at the speed of light. He walked through closed doors could go visible and invisible at will. He went through the sea of glass and didn't freeze to death. Revelation gives a good description of what Jesus Christ looks like in his glorified body. Revelation 1, 13 through 16 says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had his, in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. After he judges us at the judgment seat of Christ, and we eat with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we are coming back with him on white horses, as it talks about in Revelation 19, 11 through 14, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. He's coming back to take over at the second advent. They won't crucify him again. He will slay all the God-haters and the blood will be up to the horses' bridles. He is going to set up his kingdom and rule and reign with a rod of iron for a thousand years, with Satan chained up in the bottomless pit. Then the devil is going to be out just for a little season, and Jesus Christ defeats him again. Revelation 20 and verse 9 says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. The last battle against Satan was so short that it only gets one verse in Revelation chapter 20. And then after this, every lost man from all ages, along with the Old Testament saints, and the tribulation saints, and the millennial saints, they will all be judged at the great white throne judgment by the Lord Jesus Christ. When a man is cast into the lake of fire, all men will agree that he deserved it and God will get the last laugh. God will laugh when he tosses 
these Christ rejectors into the lake of fire. Proverbs one twenty six says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the same God who said that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked also said that he will rejoice over you to destroy you. In Deuteronomy 28.63 Would God be a just God if he didn't rejoice over getting justice? And Revelation 21 talks about a new heaven that the Lord will make. There is going to be no more crying or sorrow or any pain. No devils or unclean spirits to cause us to lust and sin. And the number of God's people will continue to increase. Revelation or Isaiah 9 7 says of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this and Jude 125 to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever amen Jesus Christ who has always been here will continue to be here for all eternity, getting worship from the saints, the angels, and all of his creation.